and for another, um, well, for both uh, another edition, uh, you know, in the series we're doing um, about uh, capturing community and digital storytelling and uh, uh, community driven archives, but also um, more of our foibles with uh, using WebEx for events. Um, mm -hmm. Glad everybody can be here and we are very pleased um, to be welcoming uh, professors Heather Perry and um, David Todd Lawrence um, from the University of uh, St. Thomas. They are the co-directors of the Urban Art Mapping Research Project, which is a multidisciplinary group of faculty and students engaged in the analysis of art in the streets since 2018. Uh, they are actively documenting and analyzing street art created in the context of COVID-19, uh, the urban art mapping, COVID-19 street art, and the 2020 uprisings, George Floyd and anti-racist street art. Uh, so thank you very much um, to both uh, Heather and Todd for joining us tonight. And I'd like to go ahead and hand things over to you. Thank you, and um, we're really honored to be here. Todd's going to share his screen. Hopefully that will work and we can look at our presentation as well. Or maybe we'll have you okay, share so it, Amy, I'm not sure. Yeah, why not? Do you, are you able to share that? Because we didn't get to practice beforehand. Hold on, let me just um, pull that up. Or if you can, okay. I got it. So let's oh, go into my... Share this and share. Hopefully, we are looking at this. And there it is. Is that? Yes, that works. So, Amy, we'll just direct you to change slides if you don't mind. My pleasure. Good. Thanks. Well, thank you again for having us here. It's really an honor for us to be here and we're happy to be able to talk as part of this, the series that's going on. Uh, as Amy said, I'm Heather Shirey. I'm a faculty member in art history and I'm the co-director of the Urban Art Mapping Research Project at the University of St. Thomas, which is located in Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. For the past year, our team has been working on systematically documenting street art globally, creating what Stuart Hall refers to as living archives relating to the dual pandemics that are shaping the world, COVID-19 and systemic racism. And we can go to the next slide. Hi everybody, um, I'm Todd Lawrence. Um, sorry, I came in late. Um, I'm a folklorist and ethnographer in the English department at the University of St. Thomas. And I'm another one of the co-directors of the Urban Art Mapping Project. Um, Urban Art Mapping is an interdisciplinary multiracial research team, as Amy mentioned, and our collective backgrounds in folklore and um, cultural studies, geography, um, and art history shape the core methodology of our project. And so the slide that you're looking at right now shows um, some various iterations of our team. We've actually been working on street art for almost three years now, actually uh, over three years now. And um, the picture in the bottom right corner shows the most recent iteration of our team. This was taken uh, la actually this summer, I think. And we're now in the process of uh, sort of uh, transitioning. We, some members have uh, graduated and we're bringing some new members onto the team, something that happens every single fall. So we're doing that now. Our faculty team also, faculty team also includes a geographer named Paul Laura, who's in the picture on the lower right. And Paul brings to us experience with spatial analysis. One of the goals of the projects is to use community archiving to explore how place shapes art and then in turn, how art redefines and remakes urban space in ways that generate political dialogue, amplify marginalized voices, and hopefully promote change. And we can go to the next slide. Yep. Okay, so why street art? Well, street art is ephemeral and fleeting, but it can be, it can reveal immediate responses uh, to the <clears throat> immediate responses to world events in a manner that can be raw, direct, and revealing. These visual expressions can help make externally visible what people think, what they believe and feel, uh, both individually and in groups. In the context of crisis, we'd argue that street art has the potential to reach a wide global audience, transform and activate public space, and foster a sustained critical dialogue. In this moment of two pandemics, as Heather mentioned, COVID-19 and, and racism, art in the streets can provide a distinct and radical kind of art exhibition, one accessible to everyone who lives in and moves through public space. 
Um, so initially our project, um, when we started the databases was really response to um, sort of slick online slideshows that we saw from a lot of online publishers, uh, publications that focus only on the most aesthetically pleasing, largest, most colorful, and most visually striking murals, and almost always murals associated with recent social and political crisis. But we wanted to focus on uh, a much wider range of street art, um, graffiti, stickers, wheat paste, light projections, and more, in addition to murals. Really, anything painted, drawn on, projected onto, or affixed to permanent structures in the built environment. And so on this slide, you can see we've got three um, examples from the database on the bottom right is a piece by Zabu, which is uh, was documented in London. And this is an example of the kinds of, um, uh, of, uh, um, uh, of uh, pieces that are um, aesthetically pleasing, um, that uh, are likely to stay around, are likely to be preserved in their original location. The other two pieces um, are pieces which are the kind that would likely come down. So you can see at the top there is an example of a piece on a board in Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, in a lot of cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, of course, as well. Um, boards went up on a lot of, uh, of city buildings um, around the time of the uprising to both cover over broken windows and to prevent windows from being broken. And they became like canvases. People started to put up art on all these boards all around the city. Um, but then there's a point when they come down, right? When um, the uprising was done or the sort of most intense Part of it was over. A lot of these pieces came down. Um, some of them were preserved, but a lot of them ended up being thrown away. Um, and then on the top left, you can see a piece that's um, a tag anti-police graffiti right on um, a gas pump at a gas station that was uh, out of business. But this is the kind of politically oppositional piece that we knew would be um, buffed really quickly, right? So this kind of stuff doesn't stay around. So. Um, we're interested in um, in preserving images of these pieces so that the conversation that they engage in can continue and we can um, continue to have people to sort of be a part of that. Next slide, please. So with this project, we want to track responses to moments of crisis at locations that are associated with crisis, assessing the words and the images from both a qualitative and a quantitative perspective. So we can identify hotspots for street art in relationship to the murder of George Floyd based on the quantity of works that we document in those locations. And then we can associate these works with specific locations and moment, moments in the uprising. So these are a couple of examples of this. On the left, this is a wheat paste by an artist collective called Rogue Citizen. So basically it's like a big poster that's pasted up on a piece of plywood. And this is located on the building that's just adjacent to the third police precinct in Minneapolis, which was destroyed during the uprising on May 28, 2020. This piece is part of a series and it actually went up almost a year after the murder. It went up around um, May 1st in 2021, really indicating how this site is incredibly contested still today. And then on the top right, we can see words that are written in chalk outside of the Hennepin County Government Center, which was a hotspot for street art during the trial of Derek Chauvin. And indeed, it was a spot where producing any kind of works at this time involved some risk because even writing in chalk was banned during the time of the jury selection and the trial. And it's interesting to me this piece because previously we had decided that we were not including chalk in our database because chalk involves less of a risk to write. But in this case, writing in chalk was actually very risky on this barrier outside of the, of the um, government center. And then on the bottom right, this is a piece done with spray paint and stencil reading changes coming from George Floyd Square, uh, a site of memorialization and community aid. This particular piece was produced right in the immediate aftermath of the murder of George Floyd. And the choice of painting on brick has made it quite permanent in contrast to the writing on chalk, which is very ephemeral. So all of these in different forms are meant to speak in a very clear and very direct language to people in the streets. And then the next slide um, shows us another site our database is named in honor of George Floyd, but we seek to track visual responses to racism much more broadly. People around the world have risen up with demands for justice um, after the murder of George Floyd, but we can learn from documenting other equally significant sites of memory and protest. So this is the memorial site of Dante Wright. Dante Wright, as you probably know, was a young black man who was killed by a police officer at a traffic stop on April 11th, 2021 in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota just as the trial and the ultimate conviction of Derek Chauvin was concluding. The two photographs are from the same day, 
but they show us two separate sites about a mile apart and both associated with Dante Wright's murder. Uh, the image on the left is showing us the site of the murder where it took place, where the traffic stop uh, took place, and then the site, uh, sorry, that's the site on the left. The site on the right is um, actually the Brooklyn Center Police Department and the protests that were taking outside. And you can see that these operate very differently and have different characteristics, the one on the left being the site of memorialization, uh, of mourning, of grieving, of community coming together, and the one on the right uh, taking a very oppositional stance in keeping with the protests that were taking place here. And it's worth noting that the fist that you see in the image on the left, this monumental fist in the image of this spontaneous memorial was actually moved here uh, from George Floyd Square, uh, you know, maybe like a 15, 20 minute drive away, really allowing the community to reflect on the connection between these two murders uh, that took place about a year apart. Uh, the next slide shows us some maps. Our research is based on a large crowdsourced database that archives street art in Minnesota, but also throughout the world. And we'll focus on Minnesota today because we have a lot of that material and we're living in Minnesota. Uh, we do some regular documenting around the Twin Cities, but most of the images in the database are actually taken by contributors in the community. Uh, the next slide shows us another map. Uh, there are about 2,500, actually maybe close to 3,000 works documented in the database. And most of them have addresses, so we can map the location and the distribution and the extent of anti-racist street art in the world. And here's a map of the Twin Cities. This allows us to analyze street art in relationship to specific locations, exploring how location shapes meaning and how art shapes communities. So here we can see locations of street art in the Twin Cities, which we'll focus on today. And then the next map, shows us how street art really concentrates near sites of conflict. So here you can see some spot of some hot spots for street art that also correspond to these sites of intense conflict, like the site of 38th and Chicago where George Floyd was killed uh, around the Hennepin County Government Center. And then this long corridor, a long commercial and residential corridor, Lake Street in Minneapolis and University Avenue in St. Paul where there's a lot of street art as well. Uh, so the next slide is another map. And this map, um, if we get to that, shows us the location of street art in relationship to racial identity in specific neighborhoods. Um, is that coming up? There, thank you. So um, this helps us um, like see the relationship of um, racial identity in different neighborhoods to street art. And we can see that street art documented in our database appeared in neighborhoods that have a significant black population as well as in neighborhoods that are predominantly white. Um, and we found that it's really interesting that a lot of examples are on the boundaries between uh, two neighborhoods uh, where we see these uh, conversations that are taking place uh, with artists and writers demonstrating sophisticated rhetorical awareness and strategies in their attempts to speak across identity lines. We can also see examples of discursive conflicts on these sites where one group specific message is suppressed in favor of another one. Um, the next slide shows us, uh, takes us to a specific example. Um, this one is located just across the street in one block from the third police precinct. And this shows us some pieces that were produced in late May to early June of 2020 in the context of days of active protest, including not only the extensive damage to the police precinct that I mentioned before, but also complete destruction of a number of buildings around here, including the target just across the street and a lot of other buildings in this, in this area. So the next slide shows us this piece on this building um, and some graffiti on the building right next to it. These are all from early June, 2020. And we think they're a particularly interesting example of artists and writers that are communicating with each other in the street through graffiti and street art. So the piece on the left is by Lisa Hayes Skildum. Um, she is a white artist who teaches secondary school art. And she produced this work on plywood covering up a large window on the Aldi supermarket. And the lion and text, as you can see, read, um, see me, hear me, believe me. It was painted over top of existing graffiti, and she incorporated some of that graffiti into the main. So we talked to her about this piece, and she told us, this is a quote, um, throughout my teaching career, I've seen my own students raise their voices, declaring their innocence, only to get in, in even more trouble for being disruptive. By age 11 and 12, many students were used to not being believed. My hope is that the lion, a long-standing symbol of power and strength in my own artwork, brings social, uh, societal credibility to the Black voice so that when a man says he can't breathe, he's believed, end quote. 
So that's uh, especially interesting in relationship to the graffiti on the right side, because this is located on the building just across the parking lot, and it was documented around the same time. So we contend that these works demonstrate how street art serves as a form of dialogue. Can you see us or can you hear us? Can you hear us now? Are we loud enough? And rise like lions are the messages we see in graffiti. And these messages were presumably written by a black artist uh, communicating to a white audience, maybe even responding directly to see me, hear me, believe me on the lion, but um, also reflecting the understanding of a riot serving as a language of the unheard. And in fact, this MLK quote about the riot as a language of the unheard, it appeared a lot on plywood panels during the same period of time around the city. But this piece of graffiti doesn't have to reference that quote directly for uh, viewers to understand that meaning. And then the next slide takes us to another piece that Todd's going to talk about. Okay, so yeah, this is another piece that appears at the um, boundary between two neighborhoods, one which is uh, predominantly white and one which um, is a uh, neighborhood that's more than 30% black, which is how we are um, distinguishing um, black neighborhoods. And so if we go to the next slide, we can see uh, an image. So this is the facade of a um, bar and grill called Muddy Waters, which at the time of the uprising was already out of business because of COVID. And uh, the windows were covered over with, um, with uh, plywood boards, as you can see. And um, the, the reason why I like to show this piece is because I think it really demonstrates the kind of um, rhetorical sophistication of graffiti writers um, in a way that people often don't think about them. Like people often think about graffiti writing as a sort of thoughtless act of something that um, is just done in the heat of the moment without much thought behind it, without much intent and without uh, an awareness of audience. And so we think that the, these examples kind of show um, in, in addition to a really direct confrontational message, a kind of awareness of an audience that might be seeing this. So this piece is located at a place where um, lots of people walk by this facade and the people who would walk by would be mostly white people walking by here. And so if we look at this, you can, we can see on the left side, you've got this written message, crying about the targets, we've been targets. Um, and this is really fascinating because it's an example. Uh, there are two sort of examples of rhetorical figures here. One is one that is um, that you might be familiar with. That it's used in the African American community. It's called loud talking, and this is where um, two people might be talking about a third person. But rather than speak to the third person directly, they will just talk loud enough about that person so they can hear uh, what's being said. Right. And so I, I I like to read this piece as one insider who's saying crime about their targets, we've been targets, talking to another insider. So hence the begins with that sort of um or it's it's in uses the first person plural, right? So um crime about their targets, we've been targets, targets, um, and says twice, which is an example of the Greek trope antanaclasis, which is the use of the word targets or a word twice in the sentence with the meaning change, right? So we've got uh, targets used first, which refers to the store, which uh, w the a target uh, near the epicenter of the uprising in uh, Minneapolis, not far from here, was burned and looted. It became kind of symbolic of uh, of the of the uprising itself. And people who um, were frightened by the uprising often pointed to it as this is an example of the kind of like behavior that we want to avoid or that we want to want to stop. Well, the 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 uh, the message, you know, that the one person is saying to the other, they're crying about targets, but we've been targeted, right? We've been targets, and this is a direct, um, uh, a direct expression of a critique of the of being concerned about private property as opposed to people's lives, right? Um, then on the other side, you have just the message: your white tears will find no comfort here, um, which seems to be a much more direct message to directly to a white audience and then underneath that are some wheat paste small wheat paste posters and if we look at the next slide we'll see the same facade this is a couple of weeks later um, you can see on the right side of your screen that the right side which you know the white your white tears will find no comfort here is still there but all the small wheat paste have been kind of scratched off or removed on the left side the target stuff is gone but you have a, a larger version of the wheat paste that were the small ones on the right side. And this image uh, never ceases to like amaze me. It's this wonderful image of this uh, black woman 
dressed very nice with her pearls and she's standing at a lectern, I think, and on the lectern it says Ms. Resist. And if you can see, I know it's a small image, but you can see she's actually drinking from a cup that's labeled white tears on it. And then behind her are all these uh, these black uh, fists with the middle finger extended, right? So there, you pretty much can't get any more sort of direct oppositional, um, confrontational message. Um, this is clearly meant to, um, let's say, disturb or trouble um, a white audience that would be walking by and presumably in the mind of the writer is wants to avoid or to um, move on from things that have happened in the neighborhood as a result of the up uprising. So we can go to the next slide. This next example is also located on the boundary between two neighborhoods and it's, it's somewhat in between. It's actually just maybe a two blocks from the, the piece that Todd was just talking about. And in this case, early graffiti was bopped. It was erased and it's a consequent consequence of that the messages were not just erased and silenced but they were changed to support the dominant culture and the next slide shows us that um, on may 30th 2020 just a few days after george floyd's murder the sherwin williams paint store was covered with oppositional texts condemning the police and you can see it was written in lots of different hands lots of different colors of spray paint and this covers the plywood across the front of the building but also the structural wall of the building itself uh, so that photograph is from May 30th. The next slide uh, shows us again the same image from May 30th in the upper left. And then we can see some other photographs of this from about a week later. A week later, the graffiti on the plywood was covered. The business owners commissioned a new mural on the brick of the building itself. Now reading Reform United in Love with a large American flag. So essentially, this piece responds to the graffiti that demanded the abolition of the police and proposes that love and unification alone can solve the problem of systemic racism. And indeed, the work, I think, communicates that this is the American way, emphasized by the flag and this document evoking the Constitution. Uh, but with this work of unification, it, it comes at the expense of removing and erasing all of these confrontational and oppositional voices that previously appeared by way of graffiti. And this connects us to the piece that's just down the street at the hook, fish, and chicken Chicken in the next slide. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. That's perfect. So that's just kind of down the street, working back towards where the third precinct and the target were that I started out talking about. Uh, the next slide shows us this piece. Uh, this is one that really shapes the work that we're doing in relationship to community archiving. This was documented in July, um, and it reads in scrolling uh, red spray paint, uh, it reads, don't let them change the narrative. And then alongside that, you can see that there's some text with um, Mama, I can't breathe some of George Floyd's last words. Our work is really shaped by the recognition that BIPOC voices and experiences are severely underrepresented in the archive. And this work of documenting voices and experiences, it has to be done with care without us as researchers co-opting the narrative. The narrative of this moment and this movement and this uprising belongs to the community. The narrative is complex. We can't wrap it up with a neat bow and say that it's finished. It's complicated, it's messy, and the wide variety of works in this large archive really capture how complicated that is. Um, you know, people have been using walls to claim space. They've been using walls to tell their stories and express their anger, to show their visions for the future. And our goal is to really amplify these voices and experiences and make sure that these textual and visual messages are, are not erased and continue to communicate. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So one way we do this is really just to see and analyze the repetition of images and motifs in multiples. Um, there are some ideas, concepts, and images that repeated over and over and are really persistent, and we find that they're really widespread. And one of these is this very simple and powerful message, stop killing uh, sometimes it appears as stop killing us. And so you can see that in these three pieces all produced within about a week. On the top left, there's a stop sign that's been modified to say stop killing. Um, down below that, this is a pull down garage just off uh, University Avenue, actually kind of close to the target in St. Paul. Uh, and here you can see it says stop killing us. This is a door that had been previously, uh, there'd been graffiti on it previously that had been buffed and it's painted over. This actually stayed up for quite a while because there had already been graffiti here. And then the piece on the right is one that was pretty short lived in its space. It says stop killing us. It's by an artist who is identified uh, who put their um, Instagram handle on the piece so as to be identified. 
in this case, this was a shop window in a shopping area in Minneapolis that had been covered up with plywood boards. But the artist would have known these plywood boards were temporary, that they would come down again. And we don't actually know the fate of this piece. I don't know if it's been collected or where it's ended up. Uh, but these represent the same kind of message repeated in multiple forms throughout the Twin Cities. And in fact, you find this message all over the world. Uh, and the next slide is uh, up. Yeah, so the, these, I'm going to show you a couple more um, examples of these sort of repeated motifs. And um, this is one um, uh, on the left side, you see a triptych with George Floyd um, wearing like a Jedi hood. And in the in sort of like Obi Wan Kenobi, right? And then above that, you have the sort of words of Obi Wan Kenobi in the Star Wars movie, right? Strike me down, and I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. And then you have text on, along the bottom: "I can't breathe." Justice for George uh, Floyd, rest in power. And then on the right side, this is in St. Paul, um, close to the epicenter of the uprising in St. Paul, and on a Goodwill store, a fairly new building. Um, and it says, you, you kill us, we fight back. And, and both of these messages, of course, emphasize the power of like a popular resistance, right? To a stronger, a better equipped governmental structure, right? So in the case of the resistance in Star Wars, and, but it also um, emphasizes that whatever you do to us, especially with violence, um, will not be successful, right? And so we see this a lot um, repeated um, in a lot of different pieces. If we go to the next slide. We'll see another pretty common motif that we see, of course, because of George Floyd's last words calling out to his mother. So this uh, this on the top left is really one of the first pieces um, that we um, saw after the uprising in St. Paul and Heather actually documented this um, and uh, called me or texted me probably and said, oh my God, I saw this piece, it's amazing. We have to keep this. We have to do something because it's going to go away really quickly. It was on the side of an abandoned Walmart, but a Walmart that's sort of um, a, a building that's in the middle of a lot of other commercial buildings. And so we knew it would get buffed really quickly. Um, and then you see there at the bottom, again, repeated in a more, uh, this is a mural, you know, sort of more aesthetically pleasing, um, took a lot longer to create. Um, but this piece from Portland. Um, all mothers were summoned when he called out to his mama. But again, that repeat of that appeal to mothers, appeal to the ancestors, the power of of appealing to those who've gone before us. And I think it's a kind of a similar sort of idea um, in the moment of crisis, in the moment when you're at uh, you're you're being held down or you're you're about to be killed. Um, when you appeal to the power that you might have with other people collectively, whether they're um, your compadres that you are, you know, fighting with, or whether they are people who have gone before us into the other side. So I really like to think and talk about these uh, two motifs together. Um, we go to the next one. So a lot of these, a lot of these pieces are large murals or pieces of plywood, but. Also, I think working within the same community that we want to document, um, we also see these very small pieces. Some of them are small works of art that might be unnoticed. And then even if you notice them, they might take on different levels of meaning depending on the viewer's previous knowledge and familiarity with the topic. So this one is a good example of that. This is a pretty small sticker, the Huey P. Newton sticker, and it was adhered to a didactic sign by the Martin Olaf Sabo Bridge in Minneapolis. And there's a pedestrian walkway here and there's a bike trail. I think you can see that in the background. And then on this sign, I hope on the, you can see that on the map in the, in the middle, like at the bottom of the sign, that's where this sticker was um, adhered. So one of our documenters in the community, Sally Pemberton took some photographs of this because she had a great eye and was out photographing every day. Um, so the next slide um, shows us another image of this. And you know, here it's making um, a reference to this very iconic photograph from 1967 or 1968 with a quote that reads, quote, the racist dog policeman must withdraw immediately from our communities, seize their wanton murder and brutality and torture of black people or face the wrath of the armed people, end quote. So I just find this sticker so striking because I think that many people would pass by and not even notice it. And then many people might notice it and read the quote and be exposed to this for the first time and not re recognize this reference to the photograph. 
Uh, but there's quite a bit of meaning that's layered into this particular piece. And then the next slide is taking us back to a big shared space. Yeah, so in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder and um, the time since then, there's been no more important site than George Floyd Square, which is at 38th and Chicago in Minneapolis. Um, as the site of George Floyd's murder, it immediately became a powerful place for expression, communication, and sharing. Um, is a spontaneous shrine. Um, it's one of the biggest ones I've ever seen, actually. Um, these are performative, public, collective moral memorializations of loss or spaces where these happen. And in, th in this case, the memor memorialization is, um, or the recognition site is of a public killing. So essentially this is the site of a lynching, right? Um, this is constructed at that very site and the site privileges or provides a space for collective grieving, expressions of anger and resistance and other kinds of emotions. Um, the site caretaker and artifact archivist uh, Janelle Austin refers to the art that's left at this site as, quote, creative expressions of pain and hope. And it is, I want to um, re recognize that Janelle Austin and her team, since uh, people started to bring items to the site, bringing art, bringing uh, like stones, I mean, bringing whatever, they brought stuff and they left it here. Um, they've uh, preserved and cataloged all of those items um, this entire time. Um, it's pretty gargantuan task and they've been doing it that this whole time. So uh, our hats are definitely off to them. I also want to mention, you know, to emphasize it's the living memorial, right? So it changes all the time. It changes every day. We're going to show you some images that show some of those changes. I wish we had a way to sort of give you a sense of the of the scale of it um, and to show you all the little nooks and crannies of it, but we're going to do as much as we can with the time that we have. And, but it is important to remember it's a, it's a living thing. And so as the pr preservationists collect this stuff every day and put it in a safe place for keeping people bring more stuff. So it changes and changes and changes. Um, let's look at the, at the next slide then. Yeah, so this this slide shows us an image that you might recognize. Um, this is a mural that was put up on May 28th, 2020. So really just a few days after the murder of George Floyd. And I think this is a an image that we see a lot in the media and uh, pre uh, former President Barack Obama tweeted it. And so that got a lot of viewership and a lot of exposure to this piece. Uh, and it's a really powerful piece. It's still located here. The lead artist, artist for this was Kate X Herrera working together with a crew of other muralists from the Twin Cities, but also with a lot of community members whose names are not actually listed on here. Uh, it's been a really interesting piece and it's gone through a lot of transitions over time. Uh, as I mentioned, this photograph is from May 28th, right when the piece was finished. If we go to the next slide, it shows us some of the transitions of this, this piece over the course of time. You can see at the top left, a piece uh, photograph of this from June 13th. It was, it was defaced. Uh, it was vandalized in August, and so then you can see it was covered up for a period of time, and then it was restored, and then there were some uh, intentional changes that were made by the caregivers of the site who didn't think that the portrait of George Floyd really quite captured him, and so they redid the face. Then it was um, defaced with some racist text and some criticism of the, the governor of Minnesota um, on October 6th. And then it was restored again. You can see by October 16th, it was restored back to how it had been. And then the photograph down on the bottom on June 5th, this was taken and you can see that there are some barricades up that are around the piece now. This was taken in June of, um, that should say June 5th, 2021. I'm sorry, that's a typo there. So this was taken at the time when the city uh, announced quite abruptly that it would be forcibly opening, this, uh, opening the square to vehicular traffic. The square had been open all along to pedestrians as a site for community to come together, but they opened it up to vehicular traffic, or they at least attempted to on this day on June 5th. Uh, and um, some barricades were put up to protect some of these pieces. This piece has had um, such an interest, it's been an interesting point of conversation, really powerful, important conversations that have taken place around it. Uh, soon after it was created, there was some critique of the piece by members of the Black artistic community in the Twin Cities. Most notably, Kino Evil, who's from a group called Black Table Arts in the Twin Cities, said, quote, the mural was created not by Black folks and without the process of engaging Black people. It just brings to light the ways in which, in the framework of social justice advocacy, Black folks are still being left out. And so there was some critique of the artist um, Kadex Herrera, 
who himself actually does identify as mixed race, he sees himself um, as uh, Afro-Latino is how he's described himself in his interviews to us. Uh, when he talked about this, he said, quote, I didn't see myself as a Latino going to play, paint a mural of a black man. I saw myself as an artist trying to raise awareness about an issue that's affecting people of color, Native Americans, Blacks in America. And then he described to us the really community oriented way that he went about painting this work. He said it was his first time actually painting a large mural like this. And he talked about how when he was painting it, uh, a woman showed up and she brought what he thought was his granddaughter, maybe a nine or 10 year old girl, and asked if she could help participate in painting the mural. And the artists all said, sure. And they handed her a paintbrush and she started to paint. And then other people from the community came during the day and joined in and also helped paint uh, part of the mural, including writing the names that you can see in the sunflower that are the names of other BIPOC people who had been killed by the, the police. And then a community member also wrote that text along the bottom that says, I can breathe now. So uh, Canex Herrera saw it as a very collaborative uh, mural, uh, but it hasn't been without its, its critiques. The dialogues around this piece have been really significant and they really reveal the complexities of identity and the complexities of allyship, ideas about ownership of the space, who has the right to mourn here and who has the right to claim this space. Uh, that's been really interesting. The dialogues are still really developing um, especially among the people who are most involved with the site and the Twin Cities um, artistic community. We've seen in our observations on the ground that it's a work that really speaks to its audience and there have, as I mentioned, been acts of vandalism against it, but that seems to, in our um, kind of, um, I guess, anecdotal look at this piece, it seems to have to strengthen the community's commitment to this particular piece, that is when it's vandalized by somebody from outside, it becomes more meaningful from the people with, to the people from within the community. So tracking how it's changed over time allows us to better understand how that dialogue is taking place. And we can go to the next one, which is just around the corner from this piece. Yeah, so this is a piece called Icon of the, Re of the Revolution. And as um, Heather was talking about the I Can Breathe Again piece, that when that was painted, that was one of the first things that was painted um, at the site. And so that sort of focused a lot of the attention on that south side of Cup Foods, which is kind of like a convenience store. And uh, with time, I think um, the sort of mourning part of the a space of the uh, um, square moved around to the west side of Cup Foods. And that's where this piece is. So this is on the west side. And if you just to the right of this piece, which is a giant uh, mural that is bolted to a, a bus shelter. Just to the right of this piece is where George Floyd was actually killed. Um, this is a piece by Peyton Scott Russell, who's um, a, a local artist and initially um, conceived of this piece as a, for, as a kind of drop and run piece, but it's so heavy that there's no way that he could sort of like, he meant to take it somewhere and just drop it and leave it there, but it took several people in a flatbed truck to move. So um, it couldn't be uh, done that way. So we actually loaded it, brought it here, um, as I said, bolted it to this, uh, to this bus shelter. It was installed around June 3rd. Um, and he really thought of it as one of the best ways that he could reach people, that he could get a message across. And so you can see, this really kind of dignified black and white image of George Floyd there. And it became a place where offerings were brought and people could mourn. Um, so if I can, if we can do the next slide, we'll be looking, you can see the image and then you, you're that uh, mural, then you can see next to it, what they call George Floyd's last breath, um, uh, last breath uh, uh, a memorial. And that is a place where a lot of flowers are brought. You've got that that tent that covers up the actual spot where George Floyd was murdered. This has changed a lot over time. I mean, we don't have time, but we could show you several different pictures that sort of show this site in the winter time, where they've shoveled you know a path through the snow so that you can get to certain areas. You can see it in the springtime of 2021, where there were a lot of uh, like planters around it, and they actually built. A, uh, a a greenhouse and started to build to grow plants there. You know, um, again demonstrating the ways that this whole space had all these different kinds of functions for um, people who are holding that space and for the community itself. Um, the next slide is this is just another really recent slide, 
and it shows that same spot, George Floyd's last breath memorial. But you can see that the 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 um, uh, the tent's gone, and now the these barriers are up that that Heather was talking about a second ago. Um, and I think it's important, you know, to sort of recognize that the city always had a plan to reopen both of these streets. Um, uh, Chicago Avenue is a pretty a fairly busy thoroughfare that they wanted to open this up to traffic again. Um, the uh, the activists who were holding that space, they held it for a year and a half, right? Um, but eventually, um, this the, either it's either the necessity of having traffic, which is what the city will say, but I also think it has to do with the sort of um, potential power of the space as a place where, as an autonomous play, space, as a place where people in the community were making decisions about what would happen there, um, that's kind of has to be one of the reasons why this place, this space had to be sort of taken back in a way. And I think what this image shows us is the way that even the Jersey barriers that they put up to separate people from the cars and whatever have become a site for art, have become a site for expression and part of, of the place where people are, are leaving offerings. So I think that's really important to see. And this is just from a few days ago. Next slide, I think. So this is located just across the street from Cup Foods. And this is the Speedway gas station at 38th in Chicago. Um, in the days right after George Floyd's murder, it was seized and it was covered with graffiti and images all over, all over the walls, the pavement, the gas pumps were covered. Uh, I think in this slide, you can see like right at the very end on the right side, you can see some text that includes a quote from Malcolm X that reads, quote, the future belongs to those who prepare for it today. And that quote is still up. It's changed a lot. So the next slide shows us how, how it looks more currently. Um, these are some images from May 25th, 2021. So a year after George Floyd was killed. The site was subsequently, it was renamed People's Way. And you can see that in the image on the left. Uh, you can see that there um, are some silver spray painted boards with black script that are leaning against the building. And these are the demands of this 24 citizen demands for George Floyd Square for things that should happen before the square would be reopened to vehicular traffic. And then under the updated sign, well, you can see um, graffiti text reading justice. And then you can see this uh, mural of Paul Castaway and his son. Paul Castaway was killed by the police in Denver in 2015. This mural, it's its really beautiful. It was created with multicolor washes with these beautiful blues and yellows and teals and greens and all kinds of colors. Um, and then there's um, bears in this too. This was, um, it includes some text that says, remember my name and the birth date and the death date of um, Paul Castaway. This was painted by a muralist named Wes Winship in the fall of 2020. And it's really significant because we think it's the first large permanent work at the site to make a reference to intersecting issues impacting the native community as well. And that's something that's happened at the site over the course of time is that there's um, a tendency to, let's say when Dante Wright was killed in a Brooklyn center, he was also mourned and memorialized here at George Floyd Square. So it's taken on this very broad meaning, but I think this, this painting of Paul Castaway is really significant. And we can go to the next slide. Okay, so um, a significant part of the work that we do, and we mentioned it, um, both of us has been, have mentioned this in this presentation, is interviewing, ethnographic interviewing of, um, we've done interviews with artists, activists, preservationists, community members, and other stakeholders. And um, we really think that, you know, qualitative and ethnographic research provides like another layer of data for us. So we um, you know, are documenting art and we're thinking about art in terms of space and art's impact on the community, as well as people who live in the community, their reaction and response to the art. Um, so we can talk to, for example, people who live in a community and talk to them and ask them questions about how the art impacts their lives and sort of get data that refers to that um, through narratives of, you know, their experience with art. We can also talk, talk to um, to artists themselves. And I think this is really, really interesting and fascinating for us to get a sense of how artists are thinking about their art and the impact that it will have on their, on the communities that they work in. Obviously, a, a lot of the art that's documented in the database, we don't even know who did it because, you know, 
it's graffiti and it's anonymous. And so it's really difficult for, it would be difficult for us to find out who did it. But in the cases when we do know um, who did a piece of art, we try to reach out to those folks and we try um, to do interviews with them and they um, turn out to be really, really fascinating. So you can see here pictures of uh, Thomasina Top Air in the top left and Bayou uh, top right and Kadex Herrera who Heather talked about earlier and Janelle Austin, who I quoted earlier, who's a preservationist at uh, George Floyd Square. So we really think that um, we want, we're interested in hearing the stories from the community about the art, and we're interested in hearing the narratives from artists about um, their creation, creative practices, the creation of pieces, how they think about art, um, both its impact on them as they create the art and its impact on the community um, when the art goes out into the world. Um, next slide. Our project is exclusively digital. We made the decision right at the beginning from day one not to collect physical works of art. And we did that for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is logistical. It takes a lot of space to store these plywood panels, and we knew we didn't have that. There's also an ethical reason. Um, we work for a predominantly white institution uh, that's seen, of, uh, seen by the community as being wealthy and exclusive, and we knew it would be wrong for our institution to be involved in collecting these works, swooping in and buying works and taking them out of the community. We felt like these works belonged to the community and specifically to the Black community. And so we knew it wasn't um, going to be our place to collect these physical works of art. But also we recognized the idea of street art as something that is ephemeral and that is constantly under transition. Uh, things are written over, uh, things fade away uh, and disappear. Uh, and so we wanted to allow that to happen. But of course there is collecting of the boards that does take place. And um, in some ways the collecting, it privileges um, a certain kind of art that our work includes, which is paintings on plywood and murals and things like that. Uh, but we also document, and we think it's just important to document graffiti, uh, stickers, you know, spray paint on pavement, a, a little BLM tag that's on a, a garbage can or something is just in, as important to us as a big um, mural by a professional artist. So we want to we want to look at all those things equally and not just privilege things that appear on plywood boards. Uh, but there have been a lot of organizations and individuals in the Twin Cities who have done the very difficult and uh, really admirable work of collecting and preserving these physical boards. There's uh, Lisa Kelly from the organization called Memorialize the Movement and Kenda Zellner-Smith from the group called Save the Boards. And they had been working collectively to collect boards and recently the organization split apart into two. So it's now Save the Boards and Memorialize the Movement. Uh, but they have collected together maybe um, several hundred, uh, close to a thousand boards. And we have been able to partner with them and it's really been an honor to do this to help them digitally document their collection of these boards. And so the pictures that you can see on the bottom left are some photographs of some of our team. The one on the bottom right shows our team um, with Lisa Kelly working in this um, in this storage space to document these, these boards. Uh, and these two organizations are really working to get these boards back out in the public and reactivate them. And the next slide. So our goal is really to create an archive that's not simply a passive collection of images, but one that is uh, an active agent and can contribute to the dismantling of white supremacy. This is work is a work in progress and we anticipate this will happen um, as the archive is used for teaching and as other researchers consult with the archive and identify new modes of analysis. And it's important for us to mention and emphasize that the, the archive is open is for anyone to use, um, especially for um, educational research purposes. Um, so you can go to the, um, uh, the, the databases, either, both of the databases that we have and the, the, the addresses are right there on the screen. Um, and uh, so we encourage that because we want to sort of provide this kind of resource for people to do work beyond what we're doing. Um, Stuart Hall uh, envisioned archiving as a form of activism to achieve social justice. And he called for, quote, not an inert museum of dead works, but a living archive whose construction must be seen as an ongoing, never completed project. So we see Stuart Hall's statement as a call to action. Archiving is slow work, as I mentioned, and there's a vast amount of street art 
uh, addressing COVID-19, racism, police violence, um, uh, climate change, elections, all these sorts of things that um, are affecting people all around the world. So we know that we can never capture all of it, um, but we end with an invitation, and in particular around, around COVID and George Floyd, so racial justice, um, to ask you to be our eyes in the streets. Um, see the conversations that are taking place on walls in communities around you, document street art in all of its forms, um, and contribute it uh, so that the messages can continue to resonate in the future. And we do ask you all, we think, I want to say two things before we end, which is we, um, maybe when we started this, uh, the database part of this project, uh, all those a year, more than a year and a half ago, I don't think that we anticipated that this would continue for this long. And, and what I mean is like that people would continue to make art and that people would continue to submit art to the database. We thought when we had maybe 200 pieces, we were overjoyed. We just didn't think that was even possible for us to collect that many images. And now we have over 2,500. I don't know, what's the most recent number, Heather? Is that close? I think it's maybe like around 20, 2,900 pieces. Okay, 2,000. So it just keeps, and this is my point is that it keeps going up. Just when you think, well, I think we probably got all of it. Someone contacts us with 200 pieces, images that they've, you know, photographed or, you know, and so we know that there is more out art out there. We know that there's more images of art out there. I think that there are people maybe in this audience that have images of art on their phones. And we ask you to submit that to us. It's really easy to submit it um, on the database site, but you can also just send it to us if you, if you want to. And I think the, the last thing I'll say is this is the, the always mind blowing um, thing that claim that we make that is sort of uh, hard to substantiate, but we think that um, the art that has arisen um, around uh, and after the murder of George Floyd, it, we think this is the largest proliferation of street art around a single um, event or idea in the history of the world. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like a bold statement, but we think that it is. And so this is like um, an important um, phenomenon, important moment with regard to popular expression of responses to something that's happened in the world. And we want to um, encourage everyone to be a part of preserving this and continuing to um, engage in the conversation that started um, and I'm sad and it makes me really upset to know that it started with the murder of a person, but I, I, I like to think that the work that we and other people are doing um, maybe gives honor to the life of George Floyd. Um, so we'll end there. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate your, your time. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so we do have some time for uh, questions. Um, you, we have some compliments in the chat uh, for you too um, from folks that have enjoyed uh, your presentation. Um, if we have questions, I think um, Scott, could we, uh, if people would like to, could we bring them in to ask their question, or should I just plan on writing it myself, or or I can read out what people people wanted. I, th I think we can give them the option, you know, um, I can, let me pull up the list of uh, attendees and see if anyone so wants. If anybody has a question, if you want to raise your hand um, and, you know, ask it, um, it would be wonderful just to, I think, have a conversation, so. I have, I have a question, actually. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, does the archive include or document any live performance street art pieces? Um, obviously, you know, that would be like video or audio, but, um, and I, I guess that brings up another question. Was there much or have you guys encountered uh, live street art performances uh, in response to these horrific events? That's a good question. I mean, the platform we use, Omeka, it has the capability of including video but actually nobody has submitted video to us, so we don't have any live performances in the database yet. Uh, I, I think we would include it if someone submitted it to us, uh, but we haven't at this point done that. Okay. So 
I, had, I had a question. There was something I, I kind of um, latched on to um, kind of early in the presentation um, when you were talking about, um, you know, what you're capturing and just, um, you know, kind of the wide array of, you know, you're capturing these tags here or stickers, not just these you know, big um, uh, murals by professional artists. And um, I heard, I think maybe it was you, Todd, you said something about risk. And um, I kind of thought about that as, um, you know, that's the qualifier to get, you know, to have this art included. Um, so I would love if you guys could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a, um, <clears throat> I think it was Heather who talked about that um, oh, when, we were when she was talking about chalk drawings. And it may, we, we, so one thing to sort of admit about the database is that um, so many things about it, we, we're not archivists. I mean, I guess we should admit that, you know, up front. We're not professional archivists. We've never done this before. We were working on street art um, and then decided we should start an archive. And so a lot of the decisions about like how it was going to work or what was going to be included or, um, you know, what was art and what wasn't art, those sorts of things we had to decide um, sometimes based just on like a gut kind of feeling. And so we, I remember having this conversation about what about chalk drawings on sidewalk and, and we um, basically thought, well, that's not something that's sort of seen as risky. So maybe that's the cutoff for whether or not that goes into the database. And in a way, it's kind of like, it's a bit of a sort of, you know, like arbitrary, um, you know, sort of uh, a distinction to make. But then later it became sort of important, as Heather said, because at the Hennepin County um, uh, Government Center during the trial, it was illegal to draw in chalk on a uh, county property. Like they literally made it illegal to be arrested for drawing in chalk on pro on the property. It was illegal to hold any piece of art on county property, right? So um, all of those things became really risky. And I think we thought, well, this is a kind of a um, um, definitional quality of street art is that it's risky, especially, you know, unsanctioned street art, which is kind of like, mm -hmm the art that we're most drawn to. And so that's why we made a decision like that. But I think, you know, we're pretty open um, to criticism from people for the things that we've decided to include and what we have not decided to include. Um, I think we've included most everything when it comes to sort of like thinking about the definition of what street art is. That's one of the very sort of most sort of outermost cutoffs. It was the um, was a chalk painting. Um, the decisions, the other kinds of decisions have been based on content, right? Have been, you know. So, for example, there was a significant amount of um, of white supremacist street art in the Twin Cities at this very same time, but we decided not to put that in there because it actually goes, you know, it's mm -hmm. an antithetical. To what we're trying to do with the database so we have some of that we have some uh, of that kind of art we just haven't made it public right so people have submitted things that they thought well this is this is significant because it's next to this piece or it's at the same time as this piece created at the same time as this other piece but we've decided not to make it public um maybe heather can add to that answer too yeah, I do want to add to that answer because I think what you said is so interesting, Todd. And I think, Amy, the question is so interesting because it reveals the exact kind of bias that goes into making an archive, right? Sometimes we have this impression of the archive as this neutral space, but in fact, we're making a decision that's kind of arbitrary and that we eventually had to adjust over the course of time. And like Todd said, part of the decision had to do with how street art is defined. And I mean, you can imagine in the world of street art scholarship, it's people just spend hours and days and decades arguing about what is street art. And for many people in the street art world, academic street art world, anything that is sanctioned or commissioned doesn't even count at all, right? So we're thinking really broadly about what street art is. And then a lot of definitions of street art require this kind of clandestine nature, this kind of risk that takes place in and putting it up. I mean, that's almost part of the definition for many people in this in this field and many people who are making street art too. Um, but I think the decision not to include chalk actually dates back to when we did the COVID database, mm -hmm. because then there was so much sidewalk chalk that people were doing 
and photographing. And we were trying to categorize things in the database to really see the frequency of this or that theme. And the chalk art tended to have all a very similar theme. It tended to be mostly like rainbows and things and kind of community and happy themes and stuff like that. And so if we were including all of that in the database and we were trying to analyze like the themes, it would be very heavily skewed <laughs> towards um, one particular theme about community. And, and, and maybe that would be the right way to look at it. Maybe we're changing the data by not including the chalk. I mean, it's a very difficult question. Um, welcome to the humanities, right? <laughs> um, just, just difficult questions that you just have to second guess for the, the rest of your life. And in fact, we didn't include those chalk drawings. And some people submitted us a lot of chalk, chalk drawings that were done by, by kids. And now that we didn't include them, those things would be lost. Um, you know, they're very ephemeral. Um, and that's unfortunate. <laughs> but then we did include some chalk ultimately. So we have a question in the chat um, from our colleague and the director of the center, um, Ann Miles. And she says, I was really interested uh, in your interpretation slash contextualiz contextualization, sorry about that, of the art that has been collected. In the archive, are, are pieces accompanied by the kinds of commentary we heard tonight? Well, not yet. <laughs> I mean, I think we want to build up to that. Right now, the metadata is is pretty basic. I mean, it includes things like the creator or the artist, if we know it. It includes the name of the person who documented the piece. It includes identification of the themes that are addressed in the piece, like for the George Floyd uh, and anti-racist art database. This is things like critique of um, police and hope and community and George Floyd tributes. And there's a category called Say Their Names. Um, so we, we include that kind of categorization and then we include a description of the piece. And of course, writing the description also involves a very, uh, there's a very subjective voice that goes into that. And it's not easy to write the description and pull out those themes. Uh, but we get quite a few submissions and we have a team of students working with us on the archive and then myself working on the archive. And it's, it's actually a lot just to keep up with it. Um, so, and then yeah some pieces are more complex like the ones that we've talked about tonight and some of them are more simple so the database doesn't yet really include this kind of detailed analysis of pieces uh and then the other thing that we would like to include in the future is we've done lots and lots and lots of interviews with artists and we don't yet have that information in the database for people to access but that's another uh piece of media that we could put into the database of, eventually um, we're thinking about how to tell the complicated stories of these works of arts in ways that are accessible. I mean, of course, we're working on scholarly presentations and, and papers and maybe a book or something like that down the road. Um, but we also want to make them really accessible. So we're thinking about how to use story maps to present some of the information about the pieces. Uh, but it's all very much a work in process and one that I think will take us um, a while still to do. Todd, you want to add to that, too? Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, the, the truth is, if we're being honest, that, you know, the analysis that we offer tonight, um, we have like, you know, um, you know, sort of well thought through kind of like developed analysis on a few pieces that we talk about a lot in presentations, but we always sort of complain to each other that we haven't had the time that we really wanted to just sit down with some of the pieces in the archive and do that kind of analysis because, it takes so much time just to like receive submissions and to um, maintain the database. And like right now we're working on, you know, a, a maybe a new shell web page to kind of like hold all this stuff. So there's a lot of like administrative um, work that we never really thought that we would be doing in the beginning. And I think both of us and, and Paul too, who's not here with us, but I think we all just sort of wish that we will have some dedicated time I mean, the best, the sort of most productive moments that we have is when we're out in the street together, looking at art, at art together and talking about it. And there have been some times when we've been kind of like forced to do that because either like someone wanted to make a video of us or something like that. And they're done making the video. And then we're like walking down the street, looking at all the art over here and over here and over here, because that's what we really want to be um, talking about. And that's where the, when the ideas, when the analysis really comes. So. Um, I, I really do hope um, that at, at some point 
we'll be able to carve out some time for ourselves to really do more of that analysis and and allow that to accompany um, the the records in some way. I mean, I think I'm I'm sort of of two minds about it because I want I think it would be a great idea. I would love to have this sort of analysis with the records so that you know for students and people um, who you know want to be guided in how they see the art. But on the, on the other hand, I almost like want people to like experience the art in a kind of I know it's not a neutral way, but in a way that where they're not necessarily um, you know, sort of the, the viewing of the art isn't framed by what we think about it necessarily. So, I mean, that's something to consider as well. And I think, you know, Heather was sort of talking about that, how the, the database is never going to be neutral and to sort of want it to be neutral is a bit of a pipe dream. Um, uh, but, you know, like thinking about how people will engage with the art is definitely something we have to think about when we're um, considering doing something like that, how it should be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's such a good point, Todd. Like, we don't want to dictate to people what they should think about the art, and we don't want to just bring our lens to it as researchers working on these pieces. And I do notice sometimes that when I have students work with the database uh, and they're writing about some pieces, sometimes the description even just shapes so much what they see, right? Because the description, you're looking at a wall with maybe a bunch of graffiti and some images on it, and as the person describing it, you're going to gravitate to the things that are most interesting to you. But um, a student could potentially look at it and see something totally different. But sometimes they read the description and that is what it means. And um, so I think there is some concern that if we include too much of our contextualization um, and our interpretations in the database, it really does kind of cement meaning in a way that we don't want to. Like we don't want to be the authoritative voices of this database. We want it to be community driven. We want artists to be able to write about what their work means and include that in the database. Um, I love it if people can make comments, if people want to make comments about how they read pieces. I think that's really, really cool. Um, so it's always, always a work in progress. Um, when we talk to artists, that's also a way that we get a lot of the context. And whenever we're talking to artists, we're always getting ideas about all these themes that repeat over and over, like the idea of art as a form of healing, the idea of making art as a form of healing, so there are so many things that we want to pursue in terms of this interpretation, but we've got to find more time for it. Can I just ask, um, you know, what your backgrounds are, uh, you know, like what your discipline is and, you know, kind of how um, you guys came together to form this team? I know you have another colleague that isn't here tonight, but I, I'd just love to hear, uh, you know, how this all kind of came together because, you know, being part of the center, um, you know, it's uh, we have an advisory board with faculty members all across campus, but um, in many different disciplines, but share a love and affinity to um, support the humanities and, um, you know, build partnerships and went work interdisciplinarity uh, into our work. So I just I, I talked a little too much there, but I would love to hear a little bit about you guys and, um, you know, how this came to be. Yeah. Well, we're not archivists, as you can see. We're not <laughs> professional archivists <laughs> when we took on this project. Um, so I'm an art historian, and my work has always been pretty interested in art in public space. I've done a lot of work on um, our, like memorial sculptures and representations of identity in public space. My own background, my area is really the is Africa and the African diaspora. I did research in Brazil for many years, and I continue to be interested in Brazil. Um, but I came to street art. Really, we started with street art together with this project. I was always interested in this idea of communication through public space, thinking more broadly about who does art speak to and where does art speak from. Uh, and so that's maybe part of how it got started. Todd and I have been colleagues for many years. We always wanted to do a project together, or teach something together. I always really, really, really wanted to do a project with Todd. Uh, and so now what happened? Then the dean's office decided to have these grants that were interdisciplinary in nature and would bring people together across the College of Arts and Sciences. And so um, that's how it started, right, Todd? It was your, it was your idea, Heather. I mean, uh, you should give yourself credit for that. Um, yeah, the, these uh, these grants came up and Heather said, let's let's write a grant. And she asked uh, Paul, we, you know, so we got together. Um, and it really has worked out. I, I'm a, I'm a folklorist, and I teach in an English department, so I'm a literary scholar, literary uh, scholar, but I also am a um, a cultural studies person, and uh, some of my um, 
some of my previous sort of research was uh, around um, vernacular memorials and spontaneous memorials, in particular, um, the spontaneous memorial at uh, Shanksville at the Flight 93, where Flight 93 crashed. Um, so I, many, many, many years ago, so back like in 2002, um, started like um, working on that and sort of collecting images of the stuff that people were bringing to some of those first spontaneous memorials. And so um, I became really interested in graffiti at that moment because graffiti was a part of those sites um, sort of outside of the, if so if a spontaneous memorial could have like an inside and an outside, outside of the, of the spontaneous memorial, there was a lot of graffiti on like parking bumpers where people were parking in the lots that was really pro-war and it was like really interesting to me. So that's when I became really interested in street art. And then of course, Heather being um, an art historian and, and we would talk about these things from time to time. So I think she knew that I was interested in street art. I was interested in space. Um, and uh, so I, I got lucky enough to be one of, one of the two people that she contacted when um, she wanted to do this project. And I think, you know, it's really important to um, mention that you know, I think we started out talking about how the interdisciplinary nature, like where we all come from these different um, departments. I mean, Paul, all the mapping stuff comes from Paul. I mean, if Paul was here, he could do like a whole hour long talk just about the mapping stuff, which everyone loves the mapping stuff. And it's it's just fantastic stuff. Um, and so to bring that to, you know, a folklorist and an ethnographer who is all about interviewing people and observing and trying to think about, you know, culture and how it functions, with uh, an art historian. And then when you add all that together to what our students bring, so we have this you know, pretty massive student team and they all come from different departments. They all come from different um, interests and emphases. And, and so they bring that to the work as well. So um, it's been really, really fruitful, really, really gratifying, like just really, really like, I don't know, great to work as part of a team where Every time you think like, oh yeah, we covered everything, someone goes, well, but in you know, in engineering or whatever, like, we would talk about it this way or whatever. And it, it really is like we've got we've had students who were from business, we've had students who were from um, I, I don't know uh, communication studies, we've had um, students from um, American culture and difference, art history, um, history, um, like. I don't know, all kinds of different areas. And they all sort of bring this different kind of lens to looking at this stuff. And when we thought, you know, we should do things this way, they were like, no, have you considered doing it that way? And they're always sort of, I think we've made them members of the team in a way that they feel comfortable challenging us. Like if we say, this is what we think, or this is what we're gonna do with their sort of like, have you thought about this? Maybe we should, I don't think we should do it that way. And that really makes the team better and it makes the project better in the long run. Um, I have, we have another question um, from Professor Miles and it is, uh, you know, since you were just talking about your students and kind of this amazing uh, group that you've brought together, uh, she asked, how did you recruit your students? Um, was this a class or something? Yeah, no, it's not really a class and we're constantly refining our methods too for <laughs> forming the team. Um, I mean, it tends to be that students just hear about the project, maybe from us talking about it, or maybe they hear about it in a class and they express a lot of enthusiasm for the project. And so we've invited people on that way. Um, I have taught some classes on street art. So we have a couple of new students who are doing some of the work with the database who had taken my classes previously and had a real affinity for working with the database. So they ended up joining the team. Um, and then we've um, kind of like had people apply over the course of time. We've had undergraduate students. Uh, we've had some graduate students working on the team. Um, we've yeah, had a high school, school intern, intern who was a sophomore last year. Uh, so it's been a pretty, a very gratifying experience really to work with all of them. I don't know if we have any other questions. Um, I will mention uh, if you know anybody has some th things they're still thinking about um, that Heather and Todd will be joining us again for um, our you know the to cap off all of this programming. We're going to bring together um, all of the guest scholars, um, and it would be a wonderful time to ask questions and um, bounce ideas off of one another. And I, I think there's a lot of interesting perspectives to be added. 
So um, with that, I guess uh, we can um, we can let people think about what they want to ask you uh, for two weeks, um, and it would you know be great. I think uh, when we come together then um, to think of ways, uh, you know, I think the folks here in Kalamazoo, if we want to think of ways that we could envision some work like this in, you know, our our space and, you know, get uh, advice from experts uh, doing it so successfully, that would be great. So with that, I want to thank everybody uh, for attending tonight and a huge thank you to Todd and Heather for joining us and for sharing your uh, spectacular work and uh, just the um, it's very moving to to see the evolution of uh, you know what you've been capturing out there. So, well, thanks so much for having us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We will see you soon. Bye bye. All right, take care. Bye bye. Bye right. bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's fantastic. Thanks so much. Good night. Good night.